after my ovary was removed, the shift in my hormones was so profound um, that my ADHD that had sort of been like under the surface, you know, like that kind of thing, um, really started showing up in a lot more places in my life in a way that was very, very scary. I couldn't remember things. I couldn't uh, focus. I couldn't sit down to do my work. And so my I got diagnosed with ADHD. And I learned that ADHD um, and uh, PCOS, polycystic ovary syndrome, um, are very connected. And so I guess my aha moment came like three days after my diagnosis because I went, oh, okay, there's hormones the whole time. All right. From the Understood Podcast Network, this is ADHD AHA, a podcast where people share the moment when it finally clicked that they or someone they know has ADHD. My name is Laura Key. I'm the editorial director here at Understood. And as someone who's had my own ADHD aha moment, I'll be your host. I am really happy to be here with you today. Katie Osborne. Hello. Katie Osborne, also known as Katieosaurus on TikTok. Katie is a certified sex educator and a neurodivergency specialist, and also she is the co-host of Katie and Eric's Infinite Quest, an ADHD adventure. I've been listening to so much of your show lately, Katie. <laughs> I really, really enjoy it. So candid, so real, so relatable. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I can't wait to talk more about your show and some of the topics that you and Eric um, Eric Good is your co-host. I'm excited to to dive into some of the topics that the two of you talk about. But first, this is a show called ADHD Aha, and your aha moment is so interesting and yeah. so educational for a lot of people, especially women. So I, let's just start there. Tell me about your ADHD aha moment. When did you start to think you might have ADHD? Our tale begins <laughs> <laughs> when I was 29. So uh, so it, it feels important to contextualize before I tell the aha moment um, that I was a extremely good at school growing up. Um, and I grew up in the 90s um, when sort of like the conversation around ADHD was that it was very much like a school thing. It was very much like a, a you know, little kids who like mess around in the back of the classroom type of thing. Um, and so I will fully confess that I was very undereducated on ADHD and what ADHD could look like uh, in different people and just like the range and uh, like sort of spectrum of, you know, symptoms associated with ADHD. Um, and so growing up, I was great at school. I was amazing at school. I loved school. It was my thing. But I was terrible at like keeping my room clean. I was terrible at organizing. I was really bad at like, you know, managing my emotions. I had all of these like little underlying sort of like tiny red flags. Um, but because I was very academically successful, I I sort of just flew under that radar, right? Um and so I went to college, I went to grad school, I got several master's degrees, and all along the way, I'm just burning myself out a little bit more and burning myself out a little bit more and burning myself out, a, you know, a little bit more, struggling to cope, struggling to keep up and all this stuff. Um, and then I had an ovarian torsion, um, which... I do not recommend. Um, it, <laughs> You're going to have to explain what that is. Yeah. Yeah. Zero out of 10. Do not recommend. Um, but so basically, I had a cyst on my right ovary um, and the cyst got so large that it the weight of it basically pulled my ovary like around itself um, <sighs> inside my body uh, and the circulation to that ovary got cut off. And it's a very serious medical emergency. Um, people who uh, have testicles... Uh, they often, we often talk about like testicular torsions, um, but people who have ovaries can also have ovarian torsions. It's very similar uh, in terms of like what happens in the body. Um, and so I had an ovarian torsion um, and it was an extreme medical emergency. I almost died um, and I had to go in for emergency surgery and they removed my uh, right ovary. So now all that remains is Han Solo ovary. I'll pause for the uproarious <laughs> laughter that I'm sure is coming from your audience. Um, and so, yeah, so I had an ovarian torsion. Um, and then things started to happen in my mm. brain that were just very confusing. Um, I 
so at the time I was an actor. I'm t- I feel like I'm telling the story really badly. Like now I'm like really self conscious about it's it. It's great. Um, but so uh, it was like asking an ADHD person to tell a story and like, but stay on topic, <laughs> stay on it. But so at the time, um, so I, I'm an actor and a performer. Um, and so at the time I was working at a Shakespeare company and we were doing three shows in rep and I'm the hair flip, very good at my job. Um, and so I had some like big deal parts in the, in the company, you know, so it's kind of a big deal. You know, I'm, I'm pretty fancy. I believe it. Um, and so we were in the process of like rehearsing these three shows. Um, and so I would sit down to try and memorize my lines and I just, I, I couldn't. I, I couldn't do it. Um, and I love Shakespeare. Shakespeare is my like hyper fixation. I've been like obsessed with Shakespeare for years and years. It is like one of the things that I love most and I'm most passionate about in the whole world. Um, and I couldn't memorize my dang lines. Um, and then like slowly, like other stuff started to happen as well. Like, you know, like I noticed that I would just forget more things. I would like lose my phone. I would lose my keys. I would like my house was a mess. Like I had to hire professional organizers to come in and dig me out of like the hole that I had like, you know, put myself in. Um, and it was really scary. It was really scary. And at the time, I thought very honestly that I had early onset dementia. Um, and it kind of came to a head one night. It was like two weeks before the show. Um, but our first show was supposed to open and I didn't have my lines. I didn't, I just didn't have my lines. Um, and I was like, my personal and my professional reputation are are on the line. Like I've never been the actor who's like a week out from, you know, performance and doesn't know their lines. And that's so unprofessional and it's so embarrassing. And so I was like having my husband quiz me on my lines. Um, And he, I remember very specifically, he looked at me and he was like, are you okay? You are never this bad. You are never this bad on your lines. It was like, I couldn't retain information when I did find like the focus to like sit down and learn my lines. I would just immediately get distracted. I wasn't holding information. And I was like, no, I'm not. I'm not okay. Now, thankfully, this is where the story takes a happy turn. Okay. Um, because I have a friend who has, um, pretty profound ADHD and he looked at me and he was like, you have ADHD. And I was like, no, I don't. What are you talking about? ADHD is like a kid thing, you know? And he was like, no, you, you have ADHD. And I was like, okay, well, I, I at least need to get some help. And so the part of the story that I don't get to tell very often is that that friend actually made the phone call for me Oh wow! um, to go to the psychologist and get an evaluation because I was just so not functioning at the time. And I will always be forever grateful for that. Like he was the person who made that call for me. Um, and so I got an appointment and then once again, extreme stroke of luck is I found my way to a psychologist who is also a form out for a uh, former burnt out gifted kid, uh, who has ADHD, who has anxiety, who has depression. Um, and so I walked into her office and she was like, Oh yeah. Yep, I recognize myself in you. I understand this experience. I know what it's like to be really good at school and be, you know, like sort of like have that like female experience of ADHD. Um, and so the evaluation process was extremely simple. Um, that was, that was like the easy part of the whole thing. Um, was, was that. And then. So I, I I always say it was the day before my 30th birthday when I went into that appointment, which was like a trip because it was like, welcome to your 30s. Here's an entirely new way of understanding yourself and understanding how you navigate through the world. Um, and so I started doing research. I started doing research on ADHD. I started doing research on especially, you know, like just the different ways that ADHD can affect us. And one of the things that I was shocked, I was shocked to learn is that your hormones affect ADHD, especially in people who get periods. And so I was like, oh my gosh. And so I start connecting the dots. Um, and then I just got mad because I'd flown under the radar for so long. Nobody had ever talked to me about sort of like this facet of ADHD. Mm -hmm. Um, and now I'm here. The end. <laughs> that was so long. I'm so sorry. It was great. I, I we're done now with the yeah, question. That's no, good. I'm just talking everybody. Thanks for that- being here. <laughs> Good. Well, that's a lot to unpack right there. So you're talking about hormone changes. You had a very kind of, I guess, it's, is it fair to say extreme example of a hormonal shift, right? Yeah. Yeah. Because, um, cause, so when I had my ovary removed, it was really interesting because basically, uh, you know, like it was, it all happened like in less than a day. Like I went from being like, oh, it's just cramps to like literally almost dying. Um, you know, so they remove my ovary and then basically like they, it was, it's also, I think kind of a commentary just on like 
medicine in America where like the doctor was like, yeah, uh, you know, you might have some like hormone troubles, but you know, girl stuff. Am I right? You know what I mean? Where I was just like, cool. Thanks for that, you know, useful information. Um, but, but then it was like, as I started learning more about like ADHD and how it's like related to your hormones, it's, it's honestly fascinating. Yeah. And it, there's this really cool study that was done. It was a very small study. So, so this is kind of like research is still in its infancy. Um, but basically, um, ADHD, especially in people who get periods, um, ADHD tends to be worse the week or so before your period. And that is because the levels of dopamine and serotonin in your body are also very low as long as along with the levels of estrogen in your body. And estrogen is one of the things that helps promote dopamine and serotonin. And so it's like your attention is regulated by those, by those chemicals. Your, you know, your emotional processing is, is regulated by it. So it's like, no wonder that people with ADHD tend to have more like issues with like PMDD and that kind of stuff. Um, but it's up to the point where there was, a, like I was talking about, there was a study done recently where they had people who get periods come in and take an ADHD evaluation. Um, now, all of them had ADHD. Like, they, it was known they had already all been diagnosed. But depending on where they were in their monthly cycle, their, their ADHD changed so much that some of them would not get diagnosed depending on where they were. So when they came in, like, the week before their period, their ADHD was pronounced enough that they would, like, you know, quote, unquote, fail the test and be like, okay, you have ADHD. ADHD. But during the other couple weeks of the month, they were totally fine. And so there's like this really interesting conversation that's starting to happen about now that we're really understanding like ADHD's connection to hormones, are we missing a lot of people based purely on how much, you know, quote unquote, they're struggling depending on like where they are in the month. Um, and similarly, one thing that I hear a lot as well is from people who say like, yeah, my ADHD meds were great until the week before my period. And mm. it's, well, that's because your hormones are affecting, you know, everything mm -hmm. in your body. It's so interesting. It's so it interesting. So interesting. <laughs> and I'm sorry, I just want to be really clear for people. About hormones. <laughs> yeah, let's get really loud all of a sudden. I, I, I want to make it clear for folks who are listening and please correct me if I, you know, if I miss state any of this, but I mean, you, so you had an ovary removed, Han mm -hmm. Solo is left, right? <laughs> right? If I've got that right. <laughs> and so that led to some extreme, like, or higher, more hormonal shifts than normally, like for like, for like a period, right? But like, it's not that we're having an ovary, having an ovary removed is the reason that you have ADHD. It's that that change in hormone shift is what kind of exasperated your symptoms and made you more aware of your symptoms, right? Yeah, absolutely. I just want to make sure that that's clear. It's not no, that like yeah, losing no, an that's... ovary equals ADHD. It's... Yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. That's, yeah, no, you are exactly right. Like, basically what happened was is that my my ADHD had already been kind of latent. I had grown up building systems and structures that supported the, you know, the amount to which I was struggling. But then, like, overnight, my hormones completely shifted. And so that, like, really exasperated exacerbated my ADHD symptoms to the point where it was like, okay, this is a problem. Um, but that actually beautifully leads into the next point that I was going to make, which is we see this happen a lot in women as they go into menopause, yes, where a lot yeah. of older women start getting diagnosed with ADHD in their 40s and their 50s as menopause starts like approaching. Um, and it's for the exact same reason is that the hor your your hormones are lessening, you're having less of that estrogen in your body, just like as is like a baseline. And because of that, you you know, then they're starting to realize like, hey, wait a minute, there's like some stuff going on here that I've, I've now struggling with. Um, and so, yeah, it's been really interesting. Like in the past uh, like decade or so, there's been this like massive uptick in women in their 40s, 50s and 60s who are getting ADHD diagnosis diagnoses. Um, and it's exactly because of that. It's because your hormones are so like profoundly linked to a lot of ADHD stuff that it that, that just winds up happening. You're not the first person who's actually raised this with me this week. We work with a lot of experts at our organization at understood.org and speaking with one of them today and talking about, you know, when is it when does someone who is in a workplace start to realize that they may be struggling with a learning or thinking difference or struggling with ADHD yeah. at work. And they're like, it's the forgetfulness. It's mm -hmm. often the forgetfulness and they they think that they actually are struggling with dementia. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people, like, that's their entry point. That's their aha moment. And then they go see a doctor. So, okay, now I digress. But tell me more about, like, that 
legislation. Yeah. I mean, I think it's just really interesting because I think what it, and in my experience at least, what it came down to for me was honestly, again, just like an absolute under education on ADHD. You know, I didn't understand what ADHD could look like or might look like. Um, and so the only sort of like direct thing that I knew that could be a thing that affected forgetfulness was like, oh, it must clearly be dementia. Now, obviously, I was very wrong. Um, but I think that that's a really common thing because we see that narrative. We see that like, you know, the stories on TV, you know, of, you know, like the Lifetime movies or whatever, like we see that experience that commonality represented. Um, and so I think it honestly, like, it makes a lot of sense to me that that people would make that leap, leap from like, well, I've never been forgetful, or I've never struggled with this thing, to now I am, so it must be this specific thing. Um, and I, again, I think a lot of that just has to do with undereducation. And honestly, like, not having the information to recognize just the latent symptoms of ADHD that are with you earlier in life. Like I certainly didn't, you know, I certainly didn't, didn't think about things like, you know, how I would get involved in like every single activity there was and, you know, like really struggled to finish projects until the last minute, you know, or struggled to like start my homework until like, no, it's really due the mm -hmm. night before. Like all of these, again, like really tiny red flags that now that I know like, oh, it's been ADHD all along. I was like, oh, okay, that makes so much sense. But when you don't know, when you're yeah. not educated, you don't have that background to go, oh, you know, so it's just like clearly it's dementia, you know? I, I was listening to one of your more recent podcast um, episodes. It was the forgetfulness episode. I forget exactly what it was called, but I wrote down something that you said that really it gave me chills. I, I'm going to misquote you probably, but something that, <laughs> it's okay. It, making like the forgetfulness that you experience in everyday life it make you it can make you feel small and afraid and powerless to how your brain works. Yeah. And then I love because you flipped to and it's a superpower and laughed because I <laughs> <laughs> No, but the, the uh, that really struck a nerve with me and I don't think that people that I, people realize how how tricky yeah. ADHD symptoms can I can be. Yeah. I mean, I think the thing, especially like as I got more into my work and into my research and the more that I learned, I think the thing that I was most frustrated about, and I think also I'm, I'm both frustrated and fascinated, uh, I think is a good way to say it. Um, because I just didn't realize how much ADHD affects the every moment of every day, you know? It's not just a school thing. It's not just a work thing. It's not just, you know, remembering to send the text message or, you know, struggling to keep your room clean. It is a overarching, all encompassing, you know, neurodevelopmental disorder that affects every moment of every day. And when you start contextualizing it in that way, I think it's a lot easier to approach and start having that conversation, especially, you know, in my work that I do about like sex and kink and neurodivergency and that kind of stuff. Um, but people are shocked. People are shocked every single time I go, well, you know, ADHD affects your sex life. And they go, what? You know, and, and they're, they're just, surprised to make that connection because the conversation is still so much about school. It's just still so much about the office. It's not about mm -hmm. how it affects our entire life from the moment we wake up to the moment we have trouble going to sleep. <laughs> On the forgetfulness front, now that you have this awareness of your diagnosis are there things that you look back on? I mean, you, you touched on them briefly. Can you give more examples of that, like of recontextualizing these ADHD symptoms that at the time you didn't know were ADHD? Symptoms? Oh, God. Just my entire childhood, you know, like yeah. the way that I would I would jump from hobby to hobby, like that was hyperfixation, mm. you know, like that kind of thing. You know, I would spend, you know, a week obsessed with the Titanic and then I would move on to, you know, ancient Egypt. But I feel like every girl who grew up in the 90s was like required to have a Titanic phase, you know, mm -hmm. so I never like really thought about it. But like for me, especially, it's always been that kind of inability to really hold on to anything for a really long time. Um, and that looks like things like moving from hobby to hobby, forgetting that friends exist, um, you know, really struggling with clutter, really struggling with losing stuff, being really disorganized. Um, I have, I always joke, I joke about it on TikTok, but it's true. I have like 
profound desk dumping trauma because I was the kid in class who's, you know, grown ass adult teacher would, you know, dump their desk and, you know, make me crawl around on the ground to find my crayons because my desk was too dirty, you know, like that kind of stuff. That sounds um, overly punitive. Yeah, it really was. And I get, <laughs> I, I don't get mad about a lot of stuff having to do with ADHD because, you know, again, like I grew up in the 90s when there was a perf- like really lack of information and lack of conversation. And so I don't get mad about a lot of stuff, but I do get mad about the adults who are like, I'm going to punish you for this thing. Like you're messy. So I'm going to dump your desk, but then provide you no supports and not teach you how to organize and not give you any skills or structures that you can build upon. They're just like, you're bad and messy. Right. And then I was like, cool, but what do I do about it? And then they would just be like, well, we're going to yell at you until you figure it out. And I'm like, that's not how we support our ADHD kids, right? <laughs> and similarly, uh, another big one is that I, ha- I mean, I guess I still do, um, but I was bulimic um, from the time I was 15 until I got into um, actually therapy when I was in my 30s for it. So about half of my life I've spent with an eating disorder. And there's a huge link. There's a there's a profound link between eating disorders and ADHD. Um, and that's that's really the one that I think I look back on and I go, if only, you know, if only somebody had told me, if only that information had been available, which is, again, a big part of why I do what I do now, you know, um, because I want to be the person talking about it. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's- Can you talk a little bit about that link between um, eating disorders and ADHD? Yeah. So there is there is a big link um, between uh, uh, people who struggle with eating disorders and ADHD. Depending on the study that you look at, um, it's about 25 to 30 percent of people with ADHD and some statistics stay a little bit more. Um, but in particular, people with ADHD struggle with binge eating and they struggle with um, some people struggle with food restriction, but for a lot of people, it's binge eating. And then in, you know, like like my case, it, that can then lead to bulimia. Right. And there's fascinating research being done on it. Um, but primarily what it is, is it, it's the binge eating part of it is, is it absolutely grounded in executive dysfunction. It's, you know, your, your dopamine seeking, your, you know, the food tastes good. Um, but then you, you, combine things like time blindness where, you know, you start eating the ice cream and then you look down and the ice cream is just gone, Um, you know, and then there's also just like uh, emotional processing uh, and and how we process emotion. Well, the food makes me feel good, so I'm going to keep eating it because like I'm I'm having struggle, uh, trouble regulating my emotions. Um, And so it's like when you sort of like lay it out point by point, you're like, oh my God, of course it makes sense that people with ADHD struggle with binge eating. And then even more like a lot of medications for ADHD will suppress the appetite and then you're like, oh my gosh, I haven't eaten all day. So I'm going to eat this entire pizza, you know, um, and that can really lead to disordered eating. Which ADHD symptom would you say still impacts you the most or still is like that, that the old chestnut that you just can't seem to crack the or chestnut. Yeah. It's weird how often I get this question and it's weird how I still have not decided on my answer. Honestly, <laughs> I think for me, and this is going to, this is going to be weird but I will explain, is time perception. Mm. I think for me, that is, that's a huge thing. Um, Because for me, I'm, I'm pretty good at, at task initiation and, and I'm terrible at finishing projects. Um, But for me, time perception is a big one Um, because I also feel like it's one where like we, we, it's like, oh, it's like wacky. It's like whimsical people with ADHD. Oh, we're always five minutes late. It's so cute and and wacky, (laughs) but it's like, no, it's been six months since I called my mom because I didn't realize it's been that long. You know, it's been three weeks since I sent that email you know, back about, you know, the the brand deal that I was going to get or whatever, um, you know, that kind of thing where I feel like time perception and struggles therein can be so damaging to not only just like basic life stuff, like upkeep, you know, it's like I, I consistently forget to take the garbage out um, because I forget that it's Tuesday, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's the, the, oh, it's been literally a year since I dusted my house, you know, like that kind of thing where time is so nebulous for me that I I just constantly feel like I'm sort of standing in like this like hurricane of things happening around me and I'll reach out and grab something. But by the time I, I, I get a hold of that, like, you know, 20 other things have blown past me and it's, it's very defeating. It's, it's very frustrating and it's very, it's, I mean, it's embarrassing. It's, it's, it's embarrassing as like a grown adult to be like, I forget to 
call my mom or, you know, I forget that I have friends, like that kind of stuff. Um, but it's because the difference of two weeks and two days to me absolutely depends on what I'm doing. You know, it's, it's sometimes two days feels like an eternity and sometimes two months will go by before I, I even realize that they have, you know, um, and that's scary. Yeah. It's scary to, constantly be worrying about like, well, what did I double book myself for? What did I forget? Or what am I going to be late for? Or whose, you know, wedding am I going to not show up for because I didn't realize it was this week and not next month? Um, that's the one that I think gets me the most because it affects everything, everything that I do. That's <laughs> what I wanted. That's what I wanted to know, though, because I, I don't, it's, I don't want to ever paint a picture that it's like, okay, you got diagnosed with ADHD and now you don't struggle with symptoms anymore. I mean, yeah, it, having I'm like the fixed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, it, the, their diagnosis can lead to treatment, can lead to all these things that can help, but it's not, it's not a curable disorder. Yeah. 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 How did getting a diagnosis, having a name for what you were struggling with, how was that helpful for you? At first, it wasn't, mm -hmm. I think, is my real answer. At first, I kind of went, okay, <laughs> great, but it doesn't, it doesn't solve any of my issues. You know what I mean? And for a really long time, like, I, I really lived in that place of like, great, it doesn't solve the fact that I can't remember my lines. It doesn't solve the fact that every month, you know, my house goes to heck, uh, you know, before my period starts, you know, like that kind of stuff. But the longer, the more that I started researching and the longer I started sort of like working, in this way that I'm, I'm now working, the more I started realizing that it was, it was less about having a name and it was more about having a fundamental understanding that so many of the things that I've struggled with, so many of the things that I always thought I was just, you know, wrong or bad or broken or fundamentally flawed. It had nothing to do with me. It had nothing to do with how hard I tried. It had nothing to do with like how motivated I was. It wasn't that I wasn't just trying hard enough. It wasn't that I just needed a planner or I just needed to keep my room clean. It's that I have a disorder that makes those things extremely difficult and extremely challenging. And realizing that, realizing that all of these places where I felt like a screw up and a failure and I've carried shame and guilt and embarrassment were not my fault and be getting to sort of like reframe my understanding of my struggles and the things that I find difficult with that understanding, that was incredibly, incredibly powerful, especially when it came to things like, oh, I am predisposed to an eating disorder, you know, like I am predisposed to emotional dysregulation. I am, you know, predisposed to like all of these things that I've always really felt like, well, why, why can't I just be like everybody else? And it's like, well, because my brain is not like everybody else's and that, and, and so having that opportunity, I think really brought me forward in terms of self-acceptance and patience with myself and grace with myself and kindness with myself and understanding with myself. Um, and that has been really important. I think that is, that's been the big takeaway for this. I'm just pausing to bask in that for a second. That was really lovely. What you just said, I really relate to what you've been talking about in terms of being burnout and pushing yourself so hard. And I was also, I was that straight A student, like, how can I have ADHD? I'm I'm so smart. I'm using this in quotes, yeah. right? I'm I um yeah, <laughs> just working myself so so hard and making very unhealthy decisions for my body and for my brain. And I agree with you. It, it's it does, but it does. It, it, like talking with you about also even the hormonal changes that happen before you get your period. That it, it's it even like these little nuggets that you learn along the way. I'm like, oh my god, this makes so much more sense now too because I can't be kind to myself during that week. Be before my period starts, yeah, I if I exactly. should up my medication and dosage for this. <laughs> yeah, for yeah, that and that's the thing, you know, is like that that understanding of like, oh, okay, well now, and then it's like, okay, well now I know, you mm -hmm. know, like, and then it's like that next step of if you know that you're going to struggle more the week before your period, then okay, let's start building a systems and structures in which you can treat yourself more gently. You know, mm -hmm. let's, you know, like for me, I'm incredibly 
like chore averse that week. And so it's like, okay, let's put a little budget in the, you know, money in the budget so I can order takeout so I don't have to like worry about dishes, Mm -hmm. you know, just like small, little gentle things that you can do to support yourself. Like it doesn't have to be an overhaul. It doesn't have to be this like massive life changing thing. It can just be like, no, I'm going to get you know, take out twice this week instead of once because, you know, it's it's easier yeah. for me to like not have to worry about the dishes. Like just, you know, stuff like that. I love that. I want to start doing that and add a little reminder to my calendar. <laughs> Get a lot of ramen the week oh, before nice. the period. <laughs> I love ramen so much. <laughs> for me, it would be Indian food for sure. Yes, my let's go. <laughs> yeah. Katie, it has been so nice to talk with you and I would love to have you back on the show at some point. If I ever need a sub, maybe like yeah, if I'm, if I'm let's out, do it. Can you come in? <laughs> yeah, of course. Just can't Anytime. upstage me. You're so good at this, but yeah. <laughs> okay. I hope you have a great rest of your day. And thanks so much for being here. This really means a lot to me. Yeah. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. You've been listening to ADHD AHA from the Understood Podcast Network. You can listen and subscribe to ADHD AHA on Apple, Spotify, or anywhere you get your podcasts. And if you like what you heard today, tell someone about the show. We rely on listeners like you to reach and support more people. And if you want to share your own AHA moment, email us at ADHDAHA at understood.org. I'd love to hear from you. You can go to you.org slash ADHD AHA to find details on each episode and related resources. That's the letter U as an understood dot O-R-G slash ADHD AHA. Understood is a nonprofit and social impact organization. We have no affiliation with pharmaceutical companies. Learn more at understood.org slash mission. ADHD AHA is produced by Jessamine Molly. Say hi, Jessamine. Hi, everyone. Justin D. Wright created our music. Seth Melnick and Brianna Berry are our production directors. Scott Koshier is our creative director. And I'm your host, Laura Key, editorial director at Understood. Thanks so much for listening.